Welcome to A-Level Physics, where today we'll be looking at vectors. So forces can be of different types. Gravitational forces are caused by and affect objects with mass. Friction forces oppose relative motion and the force pushing up on you at the moment, the normal contact force, is due to the compression of the material that you are sat on. So forces also have things in common. First of all, all forces can be described as object A pulls or pushes object B. So this is just emphasising that forces are caused by objects and they act on other objects. Secondly, all forces can be represented in both size and direction by an arrow on a diagram. So some examples include the gravitational force, so the Earth pulls the Moon. So we have the Earth and the Moon. So you draw an arrow in the direction of the force. Another one, you could have a tyre on a road. So you have the road surface and the frictional force is that way. So the ground pushes the tyre. And thirdly, you could have a table with a box. And the normal contact force is upwards. So you could say the table pushes the person. So, or sorry, the box. Or you could have, similarly, a person on a chair. So physical quantities that have direction as well as size are called vectors. So these are examples of vectors, okay? And quantities with size only are scalars. So the word scalar can be, be replaced by the word magnitude. So vectors have magnitude and direction, however scalars only have magnitude. So there's some examples of vectors and scalars that you would need to know for A-level. So vectors include force, velocity, acceleration, displacement, which we will look at later, and field strength. Scalars include mass, speed, length, distance, and energy. So gravitational forces act at a distance with no contact being necessary. These forces are always drawn as if they act at the centre of gravity of the object. The gravitational force acting on an object due to the planet or moon whose surface it is on is known as its weight, which of course weight is equal to mass times the gravitational field strength. The centre of gravity of the object is the point at which its weight can be considered to act. So you could have a cone for instance, and the centre of gravity would be just about there. So let's go back to vectors. Information about the speed of an object only states how fast it is moving. The velocity also gives direction. Speed is a scalar quantity, while velocity is a vector quantity. For an object moving along a straight line, positive and negative are usually used to indicate movement in opposite directions. So plus for positive and minus for negative. So as long as it is moving, the distance travelled by the object is increasing, but its displacement can increase or decrease. Like velocity, it can have both positive or negative values. So this is an important point. Displacement is a vector quantity. It specifies both the distance and direction of an object measured from a fixed point. So for instance, you could have a hilly terrain, something like that, and then you have a car on a hill. And let's say it started from this point here. Then the distance it's travelled is, of course, along this route. 
how the displacement can be represented by an arrow. And you can draw the displacement like that. So displacement is a vector quantity. Okay? So information from graphs and any other data source we can use to calculate the average speed and average velocity over any time period. So average speed, V, is equal to the distance travelled, delta D, divided by the time taken, delta T. That's your average speed. However, your average velocity is equal to your displacement, which is given by an S divided by the time taken. So just to make that clear, speed is distance divided by time, velocity is displacement divided by time. And these, of course, are your averages for speed and velocity. So now we're going to look at adding scalars and vectors. To add together two scalar quantities, the normal rules of arithmetic apply. For example, mass is a scalar, so 2 kilograms plus 3 kilograms is 5 kilograms. And no other answer are possible. When adding vector quantities, both the size and direction have to be taken into account. What is the sum of a 2 newton force and a 3 newton force acting on the same object. The answer could be any value between 1 newton and 5 newton, depending on the directions involved. Because if you think about it, if the 2 newton force is acting in the opposite direction to the 3 newton force, then you do 3 plus minus 2, which is of course 1 newton. If they're both acting in the same direction, then you do 3 newtons plus 2 newtons, which is equal to 5 newtons. So here we come to an important definition that you certainly need to remember. And it basically says, the sum or resultant of two vectors, such as two forces acting on a single object, is the single vector that could replace the two and have the same effect. So there are three easy steps to finding the sum of two vectors. These are illustrated by working out the sum of a 2 newton force acting up on the page and a 3 newton force acting from left to right, both forces acting on the same object. So what you do first is you draw an arrow that represents one of the vectors in both size and direction. So we could take the 3 newton force, like that. Starting where this arrow finishes, draw an arrow that represents the second vector in size and direction. So then you could have your 2 newton force, like so. I'll label them as well. Then thirdly, the sum or resultant of the two vectors is represented by the single arrow drawn from the start of the first arrow to the finish of the second arrow. So it would be like this. And that is your resultant vector. So in the example given, the size of the resultant force is 3.6 newtons. Okay, And the direction is at an angle of 34 degrees to the 3 newton force. These figures were obtained by a scale drawing. Although scale drawing is often the quickest way of working out the resultant of two vectors, the size and direction can also be calculated. This is straightforward when the vectors act at right angles but needs more complex mathematics in other cases. So this is right angles, so we can use Pythagorean theorem. So in this example, the size of the resultant force can be calculated using the Pythagoras theorem. So all we do is we say the square root of 2 squared plus 3 squared 
gives us 3.6 newtons. Okay, and that's our resultant force. The angle between the resultant force and the 3 newton force, so here, theta, can be calculated using the definition of tangent. So all you do is you do the inverse tangent, so tan minus 1. The notation tan minus 1 means the angle whose tangent is. So all you do is you do the 2 newton force divided by 3 newton force gives you the angle of the resultant from your 3 newton force. Okay? So that's 34 degrees as well. So this drawing method can be described by finding the sum of any number of vectors by drawing an arrow for each vector, starting each new arrow where the previous one finished. The resultant of the vectors is then represented by the single arrow that starts at the beginning of the first vector and ends where the last one finishes, like we have here. If the vectors being added together form a closed figure, the last one finishes where the first one starts. It follows that the sum is zero. This is what you would expect to find when working out the resultant force at a point in a stable structure, for example. So you could have, for instance, a, a wall. A brick wall, then you could have a weight, so the two wooden sticks coming out here, you have a rope, and you have some weight hanging down. So these are the direction of the force, in other words the vectors. I'm going to call this point here X. Okay, so the sum of the forces acting at x is zero. The vectors form a closed triangle. Well, what? Well, think about it. Label that vector A, this vector C, and this vector B. If you draw a vector diagram, you get your A acting in that direction, your B in that direction, and your C in that direction. Okay, so for equilibrium at point X, the sum of the forces must be zero. Okay, 